everybody, and I'm going to call to order the meeting of the Transportation Advisory Board. It is Wednesday, August 18th, 2021, 12.32 p.m., and um, we'll do the usual uh, in this virtual world. We'll, uh, subsequent to calling meeting order, which I just did, we'll do roll call and approval of the agenda uh, in a single sort of roll call by Ms. Ernst with a... Uh, uh, notation that you're present and uh, approving or disapproving of the agenda. So, uh, Ms. Ernst, will you do roll call, please? Anderson. Present and I. Bailey. Present and I. Barber. Barnes. Boyles. Here and I. Crimmins. Here and I. Began. Here and I. Foster. Here I. Fox. Present and I. Geisler. Here and I. Patel. Here and I. Giuliani Stevens. Here and I. Hansen. Present I. Holberg. Here, yes. Holland said. Here and I. Jepson. Karwaski. Here and I. Healy. Present I. Lindicky. I. Look. Uh, let's see, a coal ash in for Buen. Uh, present and I. Um, McGuire. Mattis Castillo is here for McGuire and I. Perfect. Thank you. Narayanan. Here and I. Petrick. Present and I. Reich. Sanger. Schember. Present and I. Stephenson. Tolbert. Oh, I see. Uh, Jalali. Hi, uh, Mitra Jalali here for Commissioner Tolbert. Present and I. Thank you. Ulrich. Here and I. Uh, Coughlin. Here and I. Windshuttle. Hi, I. Workman. Here and I. And then I want to note for the record that, that Barber is here and I as well. Okay. And how about Kevin Reich? Has he come in yet? He was in the exec committee meeting. Councilmember right. Reich, are you here yet? Let's just go on, Chair. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ernst. All right. Uh, let's go on to the reports, uh, the chair's report. I think all of you uh, previously received from Elaine, I think it was under cover of uh, email dated the 12th of August. Uh, information on polling. You know, we got into the situation that our last meeting in July, uh, we were talking about, as I recall, funding uh, modal funding ranges and potential minimum maximum changes on regional solicitation. And as memory serves me, Mary, remember Mary uh, Narayanan wanted to uh, uh, take the temperature of people and, and have a vote, but it was in the informational section of the uh, agenda, and it might have been. Commissioner Ulrich or someone else that was a seasoned hand that said, wait a minute, you can't be voting on the informational section. Those aren't action items. And so uh, we did some investigative work with legal counsel at the uh, uh, at the Met Council in the um, interim period. And so for information items uh, in, in item two of the agenda, section two of the agenda, uh, where we might have possible polling items and I don't think there'll be many probably just uh, a couple um, I'm thinking um, just in an anticipation items two uh, G and H uh, everything else seemed to flow fairly smoothly at the last meeting we can conduct a poll uh, it's not taking formal action but it does give the staff a little bit more guidance for what they can anticipate when we do actually vote uh, next month in September on the various elements of the regional solicitation um that individual tab members polling vote today won't bind the member to vote in any particular way in a subsequent formal tab decision in, in september the tab meeting minutes will also reflect these important qualifications on any poll taken at the meeting on information items uh but of course they will provide some direction to the staff and uh since the tab is meeting remotely we're going to have to do uh our poll by roll call vote and I'll inquire as to whether 
a particular matter as we go through it. Uh, one of the elements requires polling, uh, and then we'll indicate how it, how folks voted. Uh, there does not need to be a motion uh, or a second for an in, informal poll. So I think that covers the polling issue, and uh, that is a new sort of technique for us here at the tab. And then because of the uh, substantive nature of the regional solicitation and all of its uh, component elements or topics, uh, I think that we'd best be served by an, uh, an additional tab executive committee meeting in September. Uh, so we're going to do that uh, at 11 o'clock on the 15th of September before the start of the regular tab meeting. And then we'll start the tab meeting that day at noon because we've got a lot of work to do with respect to uh, all of these different action items. And I think the sum total of all of them is about 15 action items that we'll have to address uh, in September. And then if um, you've gotten in the groove of... Um, remote meetings, that groove will continue. Uh, the Met Council hasn't made any determination about when they're gonna come back into session or open up the building. So the September 15th and the October 20th meetings will be held via WebEx and the future status of meetings, uh, whether they be live or remote will be made uh, and looked at monthly by the council. So we'll just have to be patient and, and, and uh, hope there will come a time when we can get back together. I know many people are eager to have those uh, pre and post meeting conversations and the sidebars during the meetings that are that are helpful to the whole process. So that's it for uh, my report out for today. Uh, and then um, uh, if we have any agency reports uh, for MnDOT, Sheila, are you here with us? Sheila is here. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm here for Mike Barnes this month. Um, the the uh, Ted okay, welcome. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, Ted solicitation is still out till the 26th. So for folks that are interested in applying or sharing that with others, we were excited to announce this week as well that the easy pass lanes on 35W are open. So that was a that was a thing that's been in the works again for 20 years. So happy happy to have that portion of the road back open for people driving and transit users and all those that um, are using the highway and those across over uh, 35W. Other than that, we don't, we're, you know, we're busy with the uh, kind of increase with the masking and the COVID protocols at MnDOT. So busy doing that as well. So thank you. All right, thanks Ms. Kelby. All right, and then we've got uh, Frank Kolash with us today from MPCA. Member Kolash, anything to report? Uh, just briefly that we currently have a school bus replacement request for proposals open. Uh, this was the non-electric version of our school bus, bus replacement with eligible uh, fuel types of diesel, propane, and natural gas for cleaner uh, school buses. And then we are in the process of planning our clean diesel off-road equipment RFP that will be later this fall. We don't have a specific date, but we're continuing to work on it for a, a fall release of the RFP. And then on July 26th, the Pollution Control Agency published a notice of intent to adopt the Clean Cars Minnesota rule, which uh, means Minnesota will now have the low emission vehicle standards and the zero emission vehicle standards applying as early as uh, calendar year uh, 2024, which would be model year 2025 for the vehicles. That's when uh, they would go into effect. And then we're also uh, tracking and reviewing actions at the federal level where the Biden-Harris administration uh, proposed a rule from the uh, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency that would return uh, the entire nation to vehicle emission standards that are more consistent with or even perhaps more stringent than what the California low emission vehicle uh, standards would be. So they're, they're starting in model year 2023 will return to that glide path. And then also the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration is working on uh, returning the corporate average fuel economy standards to what they were before the 2020 uh, rule was adopted under the, the Trump uh, regulations and uh, pushing those out for model year 2024 and 2025 and 2026. And then all of the, both of those agencies will be looking in the near term on 
adopting rules for vehicle emission standards and for the fuel economy standards for model years 2026 and beyond. Uh, but the immediate term is is for return to the pre-2020 standards for vehicle emissions and fuel economy standards. No, thank you for that uh, that update. Uh, has there been any preliminary analysis at MPCA on the transportation, the bipartisan transportation infrastructure bill that I think had like 70 billion allocated for uh, uh, electrification and um, uh, stations to uh, put those nationwide and what the impact might be for Minnesota? Uh, not a particular uh, analysis, but we are tracking the White House puts together their, some of their talking points and assumptions based on that. We don't know whether or not that funding will go through the Department of Transportation or the Pollution Control Agency or Department of Commerce if it's coming through the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, but we, we do have some sense that if they propose that kind of funding under past uh, structures, what Minnesota might get. There is a Minnesota-specific fact sheet that talks about the various elements of that bipartisan infrastructure bill that was passed by the Senate recently. All right. Um, I was wondering about this the other day, too, as a as a person involved in local government, uh, whether uh, MPCA has thought about partnering with, with cities, local governments, on expansion of um, uh, infrastructure to be able to charge vehicles in more locations, public or private. Um, and whether you'd have any of that financial capacity to even do that. Yes, and in line of the interest, we're very interested in that. You you touched on the, the major uh, challenges, that, and that's the funding capacity for that kind of work. Uh, we have put forth in the past bonding requests for EV infrastructure, and uh, we're considering pursuing that again in, in the upcoming bonding session uh, for expansion and supplement our Volkswagen funding infrastructure for the EV side. And so we're looking for the appropriate partners and be able to support more electric vehicles in Minnesota, something we're very interested in. All right, good, thank you. Um, I know that uh, Carl Kermans, uh, member Kermans, you sent in a written report, but is there anything you wanna report on verbally? Yes. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to mention, I was just informed yesterday that the mask requirement at the airport and on airplanes was due to expire in September on September 13th. And now we've been informed that they could extend that mask wearing requirement until 2022. And the other thing was we're working with the state of Minnesota, keeping the COVID testing and the vaccination sites open at the airport until further notice. So I just wanted to mention that. And then the, if, for the people that like the details, that was what I sent that email. There was a lot of detail in there about flights and airlines and things like that. So I just Good. wanted to get that out so everybody could have it. And I think uh, Elaine's provided that to everybody, but uh, generally uh, things are improving in terms of uh, transportation or passenger movements? Yes, as of now, uh, as of the end of June, we're about 600,000 passengers over last year's schedule but we're still only 65 to 70% above 2019. But uh, now they said the last half of July, travel has started slowing down again with this Delta variant scare. A lot of people are canceling their trips. So we don't know how the numbers are gonna work out for the end of July to middle of August, but it has been steadily improving until then. Mr. Chair, just a question. Yes, yes, Mem uh, Member Keeley. Thank you. I have recently heard uh, in a presentation that business travel was still about 70% off. Do you, uh, is there any data that would uh, point to that, you know, business travel being off 70% and that 30 to 40% gap that we are still off at the airport against 2019's benchmark? Do those, do those numbers maybe fit? Yeah, there's there's no way uh, there's no way that I know that we can track whether it's travel for leisure or business or casual, but domestic travels up and most of it is family oriented. So yeah. we, we're believing yeah. it's mostly leisure and family travel yeah. instead of business. Most people Thank are you. still. That, that seems to have recovered, recovered real well. And 
uh, business travel just hasn't really seen much of a recovery yet. Thank you. Anything for uh, Member Cremins other than hmm. Member Keeley's inquiry? No. Yes, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Member Dugan. Yes, thank you. Just, a, just a quick side note. Um, when I report to um, uh, Chair Barber's Transportation Committee on the tab, I will say that uh, Carl's remarks and info is the most that they want. <laughs> it's always very popular. So uh, thank you, Carl. Welcome. Yeah, thank you, Member Dugan, as, as that information is here for the tab. Uh, moving on then to Council Member Barber. Anything to report out from the Met Council? Yeah. Just a couple of really quick things, Mr. Chair. So um, first of all, I um, just wanted to make everyone aware so you can spread it out to your communities that um, the MTS director position is now posted. So um, if you know people who um, should be um, looking into that position, um, you should be able to access that through our website. Um, the other thing quickly about um, our state fair service, I'm sure you've all seen the news stories that we had to scale back our, um, our service. Um, due to our bus operator shortage, but we do have some sites that we're going to have up. There's going to be three sites. One is at the 28th Avenue Park and Ride in Bloomington. One is at County Road 73 in Minnetonka, and another one in Cottage at the Cottage Grove Park and Ride. Um, and then those will be operating weekdays from going to the fair from 9 to 7 and home from the fair 10 to midnight and weekends from going to the fair from 8 to 7 and coming back from the airport from 10 to midnight. So um, the round trip fares are $5 on the mobile app or through the website or $6 in person. So and that's all I have today. All right, thank you. Questions for member Barber from TAB members? All right. Uh, Brian Isaacson, our TAC vice chair, anything to report out from the TAC standpoint? Uh, I wouldn't want to take away the suspense that's coming from our upcoming agenda items. I think all I'd say is that we had a good, robust discussion on both the TIP as well as the regional solicitation elements. So, very good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, all right. And then let's uh, we go on to the business section. We've got one uh, item on the consent portion of the agenda. Uh, the minutes of July 21, 2021. Did anybody have any additions or changes to those minutes? Otherwise, we could. Uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, Member Sanger. Uh, is that who it was? Commissioner was... Holberg. Commissioner Holberg. Yes. I mean, reviewing the minutes, uh, the uh, comments attributed to me failed to address my central point, which was growth areas. It said Holberg. The minutes reflect Holberg brought up density and the need for infrastructure. Uh, more accurately, I was talking about growth. And the need for right. infrastructure. Right. Would you uh, point me to that, and maybe we can fix that right now? It's under number two under the 2022 regional solicitation. If I can just uh, suggest we replace the word density with growth, okay. I'd be happy to move the minutes as amended. All right. Very good. Thank you, Commissioner. Winchell, second. All right. We got a motion and a second to adopt the uh, minutes as amended for the meeting of Wednesday, July 21, 2021. Any further discussion? Roll call, please, Ms. Ernst. Anderson. Aye. Bailey. Aye. Barber. Aye. Kelpie. Aye. Boyles. Aye. Crimmins. Aye. Dugan. Aye. Foster. Aye. Fox. Aye. Geisler? Aye. Gotell? Aye. Giuliani Stevens? Giuliani Stevens? Aye. Thank you. Hansen? Aye. Holberg? Yes. Collinshead? Aye. Karwaski? Aye. Healy? Aye. Lindicky? Aye. Look? Aye. Polash? Kolesh? Mattis Castillo? Aye. Narayanan? Aye. Petrick? Aye. Reich? Aye. Sanger? Aye. Schember? 
Aye. Stephenson? Jalali? Aye. Ulrich? Aye. Coughlin? Aye. Windshuttle? Aye. And Workman? Aye. All right, thank you. Uh, the minister approved uh, in their amended form. Uh, next, we've got one action item to deal with, uh, and that is going to be handled by Joe Barbeau, our senior planner. And this is uh, action transmittal 2021-22, which deals with the potential uh, recommended adoption of the uh, 2022 through 2025 transportation improvement program, the TIP. Uh, to approve it, uh, recommend approval by the Met Council, and Joe's got a presentation on this. So, uh, Mr. Barbeau, welcome. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and I'll add that I'll be joined by Sarah Maskey from uh, Communications Department, who was the primary author of the public outreach efforts. Um, we're, we're, we've, thank you. Ms. Maskey, thanks for joining us today. We've been... Um, Historically, we've separated the public the uh, recommendation for approval of a tip and the public comment report, but in the interest of having one roll call instead of two, we do have them in the same item today. So um, I'm going to talk briefly about the tip. Some of this is a little repetitive from what you saw when you released the draft tip for public comment in um, May, but uh, if you go to the next slide. Okay, so for example, this would be somewhat rep very repetitive. So the, uh, for as a brief refresher, the TIP is a four-year list of projects funded in whole or in part with federal funding. Any project that's funded with federal transportation funds or projects that affect air quality uh, must be included in the TIP, and they're sorted by year. The fiscal year is 22 through 25. Um, and then uh, every MPO in the country does this. And after we've uh, approved after the council approves the TIP, it will be rolled into the Minnesota Department of Transportation Statewide Transportation Improvement Program, or STIP, uh, and uh, a project must be in the STIP in order to uh, receive federal funding. Uh, go next. So here's the schedule. Uh, in red is where we are today, and uh, we did have a 45-day public review and comment period that uh, ended in July, and we had a substantial number of comments, and Sarah will be talking about that. But um, after uh, um, recommendation today, uh, the Transportation Committee and the Council will see it and uh, hopefully approve it in September, on September 22nd. And then MnDOT will uh, take that, incorporate it into the STIP along with the uh, tips of all the other MPOs and the non-urban projects in their own STIP. And then um, we see federal approvals that November, December date there uh, for USDOT approval is fairly um, pessimistic. Uh, it's usually around November 1st. So next. So here's um, what's in the tip uh, in terms of the amount of money in there. It's not too different from what you saw in the draft. Uh, not a lot of substantial changes happen from the draft to the final tip. Um, so you can see a, uh, big chunks for our federal highway funds and federal transit funds. Um, and then of course you have property and state taxes along with uh, state trunk highway funds at about a half a billion. So about a five about five billion dollars with a funding in there for uh, four years. Next slide. Here it is, uh, a different look at it by mode. So transit makes up roughly half of the tip in, in uh, this tip and um, highway and roads make up not quite half, but the lion's share of the other half, 40%. The purple is other set-asides in TDM. And a lot of that is set-asides which means, for example, a set aside to replace lighting or things like that. They don't necessarily require their own line item, and we don't know exactly what lighting needs to replace in advance. So those go into set aside, uh, set aside project lines. And then that thin red slice, that's your bike ped, $121 million over the next four years. Um, next slide. And so that's all I have. Um, included in the packet was the tip itself, which has um, text that changed in no significant way from last time. And of course, the list of 520 some projects. Um, I can be here for questions either now or after uh, Sarah talks about the public comment report. All right. Very good. Thank you, uh, Joe. And uh, Sarah, do you want to talk about the public comment now? Or do you want, does anyone have any questions for <clears throat> Senior Planner Barbeau at this point in time? 
All right, let's move on to Sarah Maskey. Ms. Maskey. Thank you, Chair. Uh, to talk a little bit about the public comment report. Um, and if you could go to the next slide, please. This is a high level summary of the um, outreach and engagement around the plan. In the first area, you'll see the reach and the engagement um, related to the outreach. Um, we had nearly 150 commenters and over 470 com 75 comments. Um, we scheduled a public meeting on June 22nd. We had 26 attendees and we had one speaker at that event. Um, this is a list of the interest groups and agencies that were engaged. Um, and here are the methods used. Uh, we did a web announcement, web page notice, gov delivery, email announcement, Facebook, Twitter, Star Tribune, classified ad, and the public meeting. And a majority of our comments were received through email, although we did have a small amount through mail and uh, the public meeting. Next slide, please. There were some major themes that came out through, um, through the public comment. So acknowledging climate change, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, avoiding new highway expansion and promoting racial and economic equity, um, prioritize and expand transit, travel demand management, and bike and pedestrian projects. Next slide, please. Transition diesel buses to electric, prioritize electric vehicle charging infrastructure, quicker adoption of electric vehicles, electric bus deployment in poor air quality areas, reduced vehicle mile, miles traveled, and <clears throat> making more aggressive safety targets so that we can accelerate reducing traffic deaths and serious injuries. And with that, I uh, will stand for any questions. All right, very good. Um, a question for you, Ms. Maskey, did any of the comments result in any changes to the content of the, of the proposed document? I'll defer that to Joe, Mr. Right. Chair. Mr. Barbo. Uh, Mr. Chair, there were minor uh, text changes that occurred after seeing a couple of comments. Uh, no project changes were made as All a result right. of the comments. And if memory serves me right, do the comments get appended to the to the document? Mr. Chair, I I guess it depends on how it doesn't show up in the document. Uh, it doesn't turn the 135 page document into a 500 page document or whatever but um, they will be brought through the council and, and they, can be, um, they can be shared in any way after that online, but we don't generally keep it with the document itself. Um, okay. Make it its own document. Yeah, yeah the, full, the full comments were, uh, Mr. Chair, if I might. Sure. The full comments were um, a separate document, um, and those were included in the packet. That was uh, one of the attachments. Sure. I, I would just suggest that if this is passed, which I assume it will be, that when the council gets to it, that when you have these documents online, you make that available as well. So Absolutely. Like you have, like you have now. Okay. Yep. Other questions from tab members? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, members. Is, is that member Sanger? Yes, it is. I do have a question. As I looked at the comments and the clear themes that you have, that um, Sarah Maskey has just outlined for us, and then I hear that no changes were made to any of the projects, it, it begs the question, why do we bother to ask for the comments? Um, it seems to me that there were, there's a very clear trend among those comments about trying to to promote climate change through a variety of transportation related um, programs and projects. And if we're not going to take those comments into account to shape more of the projects, why are we doing this? Minor verbal. Um, yeah, members, Mr. Chair, members, um, it would be, to be frank, it would be very difficult to overhaul the projects at this point. Most of those have been programmed by MnDOT or through the regional solicitation um, months or even years ago. And I think the comments serve best to um, inform us 
uh, moving ahead. Um, actually, I think that almost serve very, very well as TPP comments as we move into that process. But to, in order to change projects at this stage, uh, that would be very, very difficult. And and the more like the most likely way that would happen is if there was a lot of outcry maybe against a certain project, but it would be very difficult to really overhaul the tip at this point. Well, thank you. But then that begs the question, what steps are we going to take in order to take these comments and use them to shape projects going forward? Matt, members and, um, and Mr. Chair, that's a, a good question. And we'll, um, you know, we have these comments at our level and we're sharing them with appropriate folks at MnDOT and other agencies, but um, that's a, a good question that we're still digging into. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Member Hollingshead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I wanna echo uh, Member Sanger, uh, agree with her comment and question. I want to uh, remind us that uh, in the last uh, comment period for the previous tip, uh, the number of comments uh, jumped uh, several fold. Um, I think it jumped by uh, one or 200, if not more. And uh, given uh, Mr. Barbeau's answer to member Sanger, um, we had, um, in that previous comment period, indications that uh, those who commented were looking for real change. And we didn't get real change, um, not much of it anyway. So I wonder which cycle, under which cycle, under which next cycle are we going to make real change if this is the trend and these are the themes of the comments? That's my question. Are we going to do something differently for the next round of TIP? Are we going to take these comments as a guidance for real change in the next TIP or not? Because we didn't take the previous set of comments for real change in this TIP. And I, I'm right now deciding whether to vote for the TIP and I may, I may vote against it. I'm, trying to figure that out right now as we meet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Member Holland. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Yep. Um, is it Member Geisler? I thought I heard his voice, and maybe a member Nuriyanan. Commissioner looked it later. Commissioner Look, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to comment. Who was it? We lost somebody. Can't hear. Somebody went on. Ended up on mute. Who was it that? I, I think. I think Commissioner looked at froze. Okay, um, Mayor, you want to go ahead while we figure out? Sure. Um, well, I think that we still, you know, these comments are taken because I think there there are changes. We are looking more at electric charging stations. We're looking at all these different things that for for electric vehicles. Um, but we also, uh, we as a group, uh, we're looking at the whole metropolitan area that if you look at all the comments, if, if, if you look at the percentage of what, what the comments are, you still have to look at the area as a whole. I mean, the percentage, if one or two people are speaking on a, on a topic, does that mean, like uh, uh, Joe said, does that mean it would change the whole solicitation? So, I mean, I think that we have to always keep them in mind that they're there and we're moving forward. And I think those things are happening and, but maybe not as fast as some had hoped. Um, but I, I think the, the comments are being looked at. And I think if there was something really, really, I, I went through the comments and, you know, a lot of times it was one or two uh, people that made the comments. There were some broad ones that, you know, a large group did, but, um, I still think overall we have to look at the whole what we are as a metropolitan group and and not solely focus on a single comment. I mean, I, like I said, I I'm not sure, but that's the way I feel about it. Thank you, Mayor. Remember, Holland said, would you pull your hand down or did you put your hand back up again? Well, I just want to ask. Uh, we're still going to have a single vote on both the accepting the comments and on approving the tip. Is that correct, Mr. Chair? That's the way the recommended motion is crafted. Remember, okay. 
if if I wanted to vote against the tip, but I want to accept the comments, then I, that won't show up. Uh, can is it possible we can have a separated vote then or not? We could. Yep, we could. Thank you. I okay. I would prefer that. Thank you. All right, uh, Commissioner Look. Yeah, sorry, Mr. Chair. I'm not sure if I'm frozen or not, but I too wanted to echo that uh, I don't know that we're a comment driven organization. I think we're a data driven organization. And um, and the tip definitely has been established through many, many years of, of um, recommendation based on Metro needs. And uh, for a few special interest groups to comment on things, I mean, I think we're federally required to submit these count or ask for the comments. Uh, but I don't know that we're driven necessarily by the comments in terms of policy. Thank you, Commissioner. And then uh, Member Barber. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would say that um, when I look at this, um, I agree with um, Mayor Winchettel and, and Commissioner Look that um, I think a lot of these projects have been built into this over the years. And I think that as we look at these comments that they come into us, we are actually doing things, whether it is looking at studying um, um, our electrification of our fleet or the electrification or the availability of electric chargers and building that network. And so we're studying all the things that are going to feed into the next rounds of these things. Um, I would say that we're definitely not sitting on our hands. And even if you look at the unique projects piece of the re regional solicitation, we really are focusing on a lot of the areas that were reflective of our comments. And as we look at, at um, how we would uh, distribute that money. So I, I think that, you know, we take them to heart and we definitely use it to inform decisions and what we're doing in the future. So I think that, you know, I'm very supportive of this particular tip. I do think we make sure we keep looking at these comments and use it as we build out our future research because we are built. Um, we are a data driven um, policy group. Thank you, member Barber. Member Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so as a mode rep and not someone with a, like a regional constituency. To hear from, I take these comments really seriously whether or not they're coming from an organization who organized people and asked them to share their stories and their experiences and needs of our transit systems. Um, I would hope that everybody on the call who has power to make decision about transit reads these comments and does consider them from their constituents. We represent seven counties and the comments are spread across them. I don't think there's a way to tell which county or where a comment came in from. So I hear the frustration about being data driven or being comment driven. I mean, in my day job, I'm a data manager, so that's where it's kind of where my heart lives. But like data doesn't take the bus and data doesn't drive on the roads. People do, and they have the experiences of climate change on them we know what needs to be met and these comments represent that. So thank you everyone for sharing all your input. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Member Foster. Member Narayanan and then uh, Commissioner Maras Castillo. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I too would like to, uh, you know, in terms of the data-driven aspect of this, I, I believe that, you know, I too am a data-driven person. I'm a transportation engineer and I feel like the comments really reflect uh, the reality of the data that's uh, you know about about us that shows us you know how transportation is the number one source of carbon uh, emissions and the leading cause of the climate crisis. Uh, and in terms of next steps to uh, Member Sanger's point earlier, I think this upcoming solicitation is an opportunity for us to reflect some of these comments that we've heard uh, into the specific solicitation and um, change things uh, specifically to improve you know transportation impact on the climate as well as improving uh, racial justice which we've seen you know transportation investments just have uh, disproportionately negative impacts on uh, people of color especially highway investments thank you mr chair thank you member narayan uh commissioner maras castillo yes thank you mr chair i guess um for me the frustration and the rub is that we have opened a public comment period 
and then it it feels as though we're saying, well, we're going to approve the tip because it's been cooked for a long time. And so it's really disingenuous and dishonest to the community if we're saying we want your comments, but we're going to set them aside and do and move this forward. And I think that continues to be a rub in the community and it, and um, in, in our engagement process. And so I just want to raise that in that if we're going to change the process moving forward or in the future that we maybe put the comment period in the front end and not at the back uh, or in both places because i think it's really important that we are reflecting the voices of the community we've spent a ton of time and money talking about community engagement and community outreach and the community wants to know that we're actually going to do something with it as opposed to ask our opinion and put it on a shelf which is the reputation that government has and so i, I think that's the rub um and that we need to honor that we have spent the time, the money to engage, and then to listen to the community. Um, thanks. I just wanted to make that comment. Yeah. Thanks, Commissioner. It um, others as well because it. And Amy Venowitz is coming on, I think, to offer some comment here too and some guidance. But it, it strikes me that we're a little bit out of sync with the way we're thinking as a regional transportation advisory board and the advancements we're trying to make along those same themes that were expressed in these comments but you've got a you've got a tip that has embodied in it four years worth of projects that were previously approved and so you're you're trying to you're playing catch up all the time it seems like and the comments might be well placed but the projects are already approved and so it's i, I don't know how you 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 deal with that sort of awkward parallel movement, but uh, member uh, uh, Amy Venowitz may have some thoughts here. Sure, Mr. Chair and members, I, I wish I had an answer for you, but I don't really have a great answer. Um, what I can assure you is that we don't ignore these comments. While we can't necessarily right now take projects in and out of the tip or easily shift the funding around, uh, as staff, we take these comments to heart. We bring them forward in other activities that we're doing at the council. A good example is the regional solicitation, which of course you're gonna be talking about a lot today, but uh, these comments will come forward into the next solicitation. And then they'll also come forward when you select projects next year. We'll be, we'll be looking at different funding scenarios and project selection scenarios. And so that is a good opportunity for you yourselves to consider these comments and how you might reflect them in your project selection. We also take the comments back into all of our planning, our big planning procedures. As you might know, we're just starting off on our 2050 planning um, round where we will be updating Thrive MSP 2040, we'll be updating the TPP in 2024. So the comments that we receive either through the TIP or uh, through other public comment processes that we might have, we take those and we do put them into themes as you saw today. We think about those themes, we think about how we can reflect those themes in our scoring and our future project selection. Um, so while we, we can't really give immediate reaction and take projects in and out of the tip, we clearly value these comments and we assure you that we're gonna use them moving forward and continue to bring them to your attention. Thank you, Ms. Benowitz, that's helpful. Member Jalali. Thank you. Um, I simply want, well, thank you, first of all, for that, um, Amy. And I would just add, I really appreciated the comments by Commissioners Foster and Manis Castillo about just the orientation to the work and to public engagement and kind of centering um, the users of our system and how they think, how they talk. And toward that point, I think, um, in addition to just taking these notes along with accepting the comments, I think it's important that we think about how can we even just conduct public engagement and write um, agendas and explain issues in a way that is just a lot friendlier to the average transit and um, roadway user? I think that a lot of the presentation of the issues is like in a regional macro view that's very jargony and hard to understand. Like you could read the same thing three times and not really know what they're referencing because it's taking a system view 
but I think figuring out how can we just incorporate more community member friendly language um, into the ways that we share our work and invite public comment and think about it is really useful as well. Um, so thank you and just wanted to add that and kind of um, retweet <laughs> the comments of uh, fellow um, meeting participants and commissioners today. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Chair, Mr. Chair. Yes, Member Sanger. Um, I have a comment and a suggestion for moving forward. My comment um, is that, I mean, no matter what I think about the comments and how much I like them, I do have to acknowledge that these projects have been in the pipeline for a number of years. And I understand why we're being told that it would be very difficult to uh, change the projects now. So I don't really want to upset the entire apple cart. But what I think might be helpful is, as the this, this suggestion was, has been made a couple of times now, that these comments need to get reflected into the uh, regional solicitation going forward, which I certainly agree with. So maybe one way to get past this dilemma right now would be to do one of your polling that, you, that we talked about earlier, polling on whether we can get commitment from all the TAB members that these comments will be seriously taken in terms of shaping the um, allocation criteria in the upcoming regional solicitation. Yeah, thank you for that comment. Um... Okay, but I, one other thing I wanted to say, I'm sorry, I forgot. I, I do take a little umbrage when I hear people making comments about an interest group is just sending in the comments or one interest group. I mean, to me, it is no different from an interest group that may be a community organization versus input from a um, governmental agency that has also made contributions and comments, such as, for example, the counties of Anoka and Carper made theirs. That they're all different interest groups, and we have to um, concern ourselves with all of them. Thank you, Member Sanger. When I look at the um, the themes that were uh, that evolved through the 450 odd public comments from 150 commenters, um, it strikes me that uh, you know acknowledging climate change, prioritize and expand transit, travel demand management. These are all things that we've been talking about in the regional solicitation. Uh, the transition of diesel buses to electric, uh, that might be something that is more peculiar to an operational uh, situation from the Met Council standpoint. Um, but uh, some of these other things, reducing vehicle miles traveled and uh, reducing traffic deaths, those are all things that we're constantly thinking about, I think at the tab and trying to incorporate into our work. And I think it's reflected in this scoring that we're constantly reevaluating every time we do a regional solicitation. Um, so these themes, uh, I think that have been repeated uh, in a couple of different uh, uh, tip cycles, uh, have been important and um, and um, I would say embraced by the by the tab. So um, personally, I don't know if it's something we need to pull on. I think it's something we've been actually doing and putting it to, to the test in terms of the scoring. Member Geisler. I think it was true. I, that's exactly what I was just going to hit on. Um, I, I do think that one thing we need to remember is that you know the solicitation is every two years, so that's the fastest that those these changes will show up. Um, when you look at the changes we made last cycle by focusing on ABRT and funding a little bit more into transit, you know, is it a hundred percent shift? No. Is it ever going to be a hundred percent shift? Probably not. We still have to make sure there are roads for buses to drive on. Mm -hmm. But we did make a material change in how we're funding transit and delivering transit projects more efficiently to communities. We've had a significant shift in how we're delivering equity and scoring equity over the, um, compared to previous solicitations. Uh, you know, we've we've had a little we created the unique projects group, which again is good. We're going to have our first round of it this go around, which is really focused on innovation, equity and climate. Um, these are all material things that reflect the themes that we're seeing here. And we we did take those comments from the last cycle and we, we're implementing them. Um, you know, I, I've 
I personally feel the urgency too. You know, there, there's a lot that we should do to make ourselves more sustainable as a community, but the process itself only goes as fast as every two years on the regional solicitation. Um, I do think that there is a lot of value in making sure that these comments get down to agencies that are submitting to the regional solicitation. Because at the end of the day, TAB can only fund projects that are submitted. Um, and if cities and counties aren't really funding or aren't proposing projects that match these themes, uh, it, it becomes harder to fund them that way. We can allocate money here or there, but if the project isn't there to fund to address uh, the themes that are being promoted by by these comments, uh, We'd have to get really creative in coming up with ways, but I, I do see that we have been adapting and addressing some of these comments in the steps that we can take over the last two years here. Thank you for those comments. Remember, Holland's head did that help you on the on the potential bifurcation or or <laughs> consolidation issue on on a potential vote. I'm going to withdraw my uh, my request or suggestion <laughs> for a separate vote, but I'm going to. Um... I'm going to, um, um, my mind is going crazy. What is the word? I'm, uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to decline to vote on this rather than vote against the tip. Okay. On a unified vote, because I want to see that the comments are appreciated and I want to see that, uh, they are going to be deliberately and explicitly applied. I do want to respond to member Geisler's, uh, uh, very sensible comment that it's agencies that apply to us for federal matching funds. I think that that is uh, uh, obviously very true and a problem. Um, local jurisdictions, cities and counties have public works departments and they are mostly committed to infrastructure such as roads and sewers and almost not at all committed uh, to fund and operate transit. Um, and so I think there's an asymmetry when we have an agency to agency uh, solicitation, application and approval process. I think there's an asymmetry. Uh, my, the city where I live, St. Paul, does not operate any transit, does not have a transit uh, desk or department within its public works. That is left to the Metropolitan Council and so while the Metropolitan Council does a great job and, and is very aggressive in um, uh, managing and uh, delivering transit services, and I applaud it and appreciate it, I wish that the agencies that apply to us for matching federal funds had as much to do with transit and as much to do with electric vehicles and as much to do with climate change as the Met Council does. And I do not see that. So. I'm not sure that we need to uh, use these comments to beat up the Met Council. I don't wanna see that, but I do wanna see these comments used to ask why local jurisdictions, cities and counties, and um, let's say, I don't even know if a school district is, is qualified to be an applicant for our money for say electric school buses, I don't know. Uh, but I would sure like to see the applicants to our solicitation uh, uh, be officially as involved in the themes that came out in these comments as the Met Council is. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you, Member Hollinshead. Uh, and I will, when I when we have a vote here, uh, assuming we have a motion and a second and a vote, I'll ask for uh, approvals and uh, abs uh, you know, ab you know, abstentions as well as nays. All right, and then, uh, Member. Uh, Commissioner Modest Castillo, did you have your hand back up? Yes, I did. I just wanted to make a comment while we're in this conversation. And thank you, Amy, for the explanation and commitment uh, to use these comments moving forward. What, what I would recommend is that as we go to public uh, comment period for a future tip, that it's clearly stated to community that comments won't necessarily alter or change this tip, but it will be used for future planning, because I think that would be honest and transparent for government and, and would go a long way to building trust with community. So I just wanted to state that for the record. Yeah, good observation. Yeah, Commissioner Ulrich. Yeah, just a, a quick comment. Uh, I just wanna say that things don't happen the same way across the region in every county. I'll just tell you, for example, in Scott County, every transit station and park and ride was the work of the county. They built them, they made them, 
you know, they got mo regional money, but, but it wasn't, uh, it was the county and the county engineers. And so our, it's not, doesn't happen you know, just because something maybe doesn't happen the same way in St. Paul or Ramsey County. I'm just saying it's the way things get done are a little different across our region. Thank you, <clears throat> Commissioner. Uh, Amy Venowitz. Mr. Word. Chair, uh, sorry about that. I, I did want to add one additional piece to the response I gave earlier. Um, one of the things that happens is we get these comments that are kind of around general themes, but as a region and as a body, whether it's the council or the tab, we don't really have policies or um, we haven't thought through specific actions, what we often call strategies to center around those themes. So one of the things we are doing is we initiate a number of planning studies that are really aimed at helping us as a region think about what do we wanna do about this issue? So in a month or so, you will see what is known as our UPWP, our Unified Planning Work Program, that lays out all the planning studies that we're gonna be doing over the next couple of years. And those studies are aimed at helping us think as a region, what's our position on this? How do we wanna act on this? A very good example of that is we're just initiating right now a travel demand management study. That study uh, will be about a year and a half long study, but at the end of it, there will be a number of recommendations for the region to implement that we can think about as part of the regional solicitation. We can think about them as part of the transportation policy plan. And hopefully the cities and counties that we partner with will also take the results of those studies and think about them in their own investments. So we, we hope to impact investments, not just through the regional solicitation, but by doing those regional studies, we can influence investments that are made across a number of funding pots. And so I did just wanna kind of put in a plug for those studies that we're gonna be doing over the next few years. All right, thank you, Ms. Venowitz. You know, one of the things that you just mentioned, uh, Ms. Venowitz, is caused me to think about when you think about strategies around themes uh, and you know here we are we're trying to reflect what we think uh, the direction is for transportation and we've got a lot of people on this call that care deeply about that we want to be um, heading where the puck is going to use that Wayne Gretzky alley not where it is right now uh, and then we got this tip that's kind of lagging behind. It's 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 picking up. It's like it's picking up ideas and technologies that are now four years out of date. And it, it causes me to think that from a regional solicitation standpoint, if we're working on this every two years, what about that gap year? You know, what what if we had a strategy team from the tab that thought about the, uh, these these comments or these themes that are emerging from residents, from organizations across the region and thought about themes that that strategy group might then bring back to the tab. So when we get back to working on the regional solicitation, we're more reflective of current thinking and not stale. And I don't necessarily think we are stale, but maybe we aren't as far ahead as we want to be or could be. Anyway, that's just a thought. So anyway, that's a time conversation for another day, I guess. Member Holmes had. Yeah, I just want to acknowledge the pre previous comment that uh, I didn't mean to uh, uh, say one size fits all with uh, local jurisdictions and, and public works departments. I think some are, uh, do extraordinary work on, on transit and others do less work. Uh, there's a great variety. Um, so, and then I want to, uh, what I just heard you say, Mr. Chair, sounds really good to me. I think that's a channel where we could use these comments to really impact our future uh, tips and, and uh, TPPs and other work. So thank you. Yeah, when we get past uh, our September work, maybe we got a little breathing room. We can start thinking about how we might be better strategizers, better visionaries for the region. So, okay. okay. Um, well, is there someone that cares to make a motion uh, as recommended that the TAB recommend to the Met Council the adoption of the 2022 through 2025 
Transportation Improvement Program and accept the 2022 through 2024 Transportation Improvement Program public comment report. So moved, Anderson. Second, Boyles. All right, we got a motion and a second. I think Ms. Ernst picked up who were the movers and the, who was the mover and the seconder. Any yes, further? I got it. All right, any further discussion? Roll call, please, with respect to the motion as stated. Anderson. Aye. Bailey. Aye. Barber. Aye. Kelpie. Kelpie, are you there? Aye. Yes. Thank you. Kelpie. Boyles. Aye. Germans. Aye. Dugan. Aye. Foster. Aye. Fox. Aye. Geisler. Aye. Gattel. Aye. Julani Stevens. Aye. Hansen. Aye. Holberg. Yes. Holberg. Yes. Collinsed. Abstain. Jepson. Uh, Krawaski. Aye. Keeley. Aye. Linda Key. Yes. Look. Aye. Polash. Aye. Metis Castillo. Aye. Narayanan. Aye. Petrick. Aye. Reich. Reich. Mm. Singer. Aye. Chember. Aye. Jalali. Aye. Ulrich. Aye. Coughlin. Aye. Windshuttle. Aye. And Workman. Aye. Thank you, everybody. The motion is adopted. Uh, the tab will recommend the adoption of the 2022 through 2025 tip to the Vet Council and uh, recommend they adopt the uh, public comment report uh, that's part of that, uh, that tip. Thank you. That was a great conversation. And um, you guys are on your game today, which is uh, and here we are on to the next topic, which will be uh, as important. Um, so we're moving into the informational portion of the agenda. And uh, we're going to break this into two uh, two elements, two tranches. And uh, Steve Peterson is going to lead out on both uh, elements of it. But first, we're going to talk about uh, geographic balance. And, and we went through these topics at the executive committee as well. And when Steve gets done uh, talking about a particular topic. I think what we'll do, uh, I'll use geographic balance as an example. Um, uh, I'll tell you what the TAB executive committee thinking was uh, on the particular matter. So as we move to geographic balance, spot mobility, I'll give you the, the input from the exec committee. And hopefully I, I've got the notes down properly. So go ahead, Steve. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, um... Just from a high level uh, today, again, we have information items um, next month. Uh, well, actually tomorrow, uh, these will turn into action items uh, for our funding and programming subcommittee uh, coming back to you in September as action items and and ask to release it for public comment. Um, after the public comment period, uh, we'll come back to you in November and ask for a final ap approval on the regional solicitation application uh, and then the application period will be in 2022, roughly kind of February through April timeframe uh, for the applications and then um, back next fall to look at different funding options and, and project selection by uh, the following November there. So that's from a, a big picture of the timing and, and next steps for us here. Uh, today we have two parts that we um, uh, put together for you. The first of which is a new, a new material that you haven't seen. We call that part one and then part two is the polling um, process that uh, Chair Helvin will discuss in more detail uh, when we get there. Well, you, you'll have an opportunity to shape the action transmittals as funding and programming will see them tomorrow. Uh, so the first topic uh, on the agenda is geographic balance. If we could uh, pull up the PowerPoint. And folks, if you've got questions, I won't be able to see necessarily, so feel free to speak up. Okay. Um, so let's go to the, the third slide, if we could, please. 
Okay, uh, that's that's fine right there. The um, so one of the one of the survey uh, topics that we heard a lot about was geographic balance, and that's how the projects are spread throughout the region or geographic distribution. It's, it's certainly something different than equity. Some people kind of have intermixed the terminology, but this is geographic balance. And so we had our staff look at look at how the projects, uh, primarily since 2014, have been spread throughout the region, and looked at it in, in ten different, you know, several different ways. Uh, when we talked about this at Tab Executive, uh, we blew through a half an hour in no time flat, really, because it's an interesting topic. It's fun. It's fun to kind of look at the maps and and think about the think about this. And perhaps a, a future meeting when, when the agenda is lighter, we can come back to this too. But the, the key question we're asking of you today as TAB members is should we change the application in any material way to reflect um, geographic balance? Uh, right now, there's no uh, prescriptive rule in the, in the solicitation application that says we have to fund X amount per city or per county. There are a few um, kind of nuances in there that help geographic balance, some of those being we fund one functional class, one project of each functional classification, and that ties back to geography. Um, you did institute the transit new market guarantee last time, which funds a, a primarily a suburban um, transit project in our region. So there's a few kind of nuances in there, but there isn't a rule that says every county needs a project each time or something similar. Instead, you've looked at the projects that have, have been submitted and where they scored at, at the end of the process through a secondary lens you've made the judgment of, do we need to go further down this list or that list to achieve um, better geographic balance? So what we heard from our technical partners was that um, they liked looking at it over a certain period of time. Again, we've looked at here, this is four solicitation cycles since the, since the redo. So 2014, 16, 18, and 20. Um, certainly you can use a shorter time frame if that makes some level of sense, but they like looking at this uh, topic over time. And um, they said, all in all, I mean, you can find a few things in here that maybe um, a percentage, a couple percent points here, there, particularly for maybe Washington, Dakota County. But uh, there wasn't kind of a widespread agreement among our technical staff that there was a huge problem, um, given that this is a competitive uh, solicitation process. So we do, I do want to invite uh, Jed Hansen, a planner, in who put together the maps. And um, he was, he's going to briefly go through a few of the, or the methodology he used. In particular, I think some really cool work using streetlight data, and that's that's using um, in-car in navigation and the mobile apps and people's vehicles to look at where people are coming to and from. And, you know, obviously the geography of a project location is just one element. The, the users of that project might be widespread. And so that's um, the last series of maps gets into that topic. So Jed, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Steve, uh, and uh, members of the tab for having me here. Um, so we assessed geographic balance in a number of ways. And first, uh, we looked at distribution of projects by county relative to population and jobs. So on page one of the attachment on this agenda item showing here, figure 1A on the screen, it shows the share of federal funds is awarded roughly proportionate to a county's share of jobs in the region within a few percentage points. But there is a bit more divergence by population, as Steve had mentioned, particularly with uh, Dakota and Washington counties. Um, we're working to improve the underlying data of, around this analysis. Currently, some of our historical projects that cross boundaries may only be counted by the project point on the map, but in recent solicitations, we do have more uh, accurate geographic data. Um, this analysis is covering 2014 through 2020, so that's four solicitation cycles. On page three of the attachment, we look at roadway projects specifically and add in this column about uh, vehicle miles traveled. Um, this also shows that uh, funding is distributed roughly uh, proportionate to vehicle miles traveled. On page four of the uh, attachment, we have figure 2A, which displays projects by council district, which are roughly equal population. Districts with large concentration of jobs tended to receive a uh, greater share of funds. On page six, uh, this displays projects by quadrants, dividing the metro by major highway corridors out of downtown Minneapolis. Some of the divergence in this analysis can be explained by uh, most of downtown Minneapolis falling within the northwest quadrant, 
and downtown St. Paul falling in the southeast quadrant. However, there still remains a, a bit of a disparity with the northeast quadrant. On page eight, figure 4A displays projects by land use, and these findings are very similar to the county level analysis. Funds are distributed roughly proportionate to jobs, uh, but there is more divergence when measured by population. As Steve had mentioned, we use Streetlight Insight to look at the region-wide usage of roadway projects selected in 2020. On page 18 of the attachment, figure 12 shows an example of this. Uh, this analysis was applied to the Johnson Street Northeast intersection reconstruction near 35W in the Quarry area of Minneapolis. This map shows the origin Minnesota House of Representatives district of trips through the project area. So that's where, wherever a trip began, whether that be from someone's home or they took a stop at a coffee shop on their way to work, or they dropped off someone at a child care center, uh, wherever that trip started and where that went to during weekday mornings between 6 a.m. and 10 a.m. And we use 2019 data here. We use Minnesota House districts not for any particular reason uh, politically, but rather as they were convenient uh, population proportionate shapes that balanced spatial resolution and being able to see where these trips are coming from, but also limitations of processing time with street light. For this project, we can see how many of the trips through the intersection start near the project area in Northeast Minneapolis, St. Anthony and Lauderdale. Although there's also a, a spread of trips that start along Highway 65 and the 35W corridors and even down to I-35 in the South Metro. We have another example of this analysis on page 21, uh, which shows it applied to the Kellogg Third Street Bridge replacement in St. Paul. This map shows that a large share of trips uh, start in the east side of St. Paul, Maplewood, and uh, southwestern Washington County. These maps have been prepared for all of the 2020 road and bridge projects and are included in the packet. And they show that a project located in one city or county rarely has exclusively local benefits. Um, rather, they often serve trips that are coming from all over the region. And that is what I have to share, and I'll turn it back to Steve. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jed. That was interesting. And again, um, we can bring this back if people want to dive into the maps at a, at a future meeting. But uh, just to bring the group back to the task at hand, it's uh, do we make any change? Do would you like to make any changes to the application um, to reflect geographic balance rules or changes or scoring? Um, that's uh, really the question. And I know we uh, discussed this at Tab Executive. So, Mr. Chair, I think I'll turn it back to you. All right. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Sure. When we had this conversation at the executive committee, oh yeah, Commissioner Look, did you have your hand up? Yeah, if I could, I just needed a couple of clarifications. Um, first of all, I'm looking on there. It says 2019 population data. Do we have a little something closer to 2021, considering the census was just completed? Um, the second question I have is uh, vehicle miles traveled for Anoka County shows about 11%. I know that we export about 70% of our labor force, mostly down into Minneapolis for reasons of employment. I find that number to be a little low. And then um, this is a somewhat of an unrelated topic, but um, you know, with the dissolution of CTIB, that um, the transportation sales tax that each county adopted, Hennepin County at 50 cent, Anoka County at uh, for, uh, a quarter cent versus a half cent, do we have um, those, those sales tax dollars now go into transportation or transit? Do we have a figure by chance or has the council done any sort of research into how many dollars are spent in respective counties coming from other counties that would then be directed into transportation or transit for that respective county? Um, Jed, do you wanna take the first two questions on the population of the VMT? Yes, so the population question at, at the time we prepared this analysis, um, the 2019 was the latest population data that we had. However, we can certainly revise this with the 2020 data that we now have. Um, on VMT, the VMT figures are from uh, MnDOT's uh, traffic data analysis unit uh, as provided on their uh, public site. And so I, I would have to refer questions to them about the VMT figures. 
Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Hanson. Yeah. Hey, Commissioner Luck, any follow on? Yeah. Well, no, Mr. Chair, I'm just, I mean, um, it, it seems like the data may not be totally accurate. So I would like updates on that data, but more importantly, I think, um, I think what needs to be taken into account here is there's significant dollars that are generated from the transportation sales tax. And um, a lot of counties implemented those trans transportation sales tax, whether quarter cent or half cent, because they realized that other counties were coming into their county, were spending money in their county, and they were, let's call it harvesting uh, transportation sales tax dollars. I think that's an important component uh, to the discussion of, you know, geographic equity in terms of uh, revenue going into specific geographic locations. Um, I don't think it's a topic we've touched yet here on, on TAP. Uh, and we want to talk about equity. We want to talk about geographical distribution. I think that's a component that really has to be taken into account. And I know those numbers are available. So uh, whether it's through whatever other state agency collects those numbers, I know that we have the exact numbers at Anoka County. I know every other county does too. So it's probably... Um, it's probably readily available and probably should be taken into consideration when we start looking at projects and saying, well, based on population, this county is getting X amount of dollars. That's not entirely the whole picture. And uh, and we should be considering that whole picture. All right, thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Yeah, that's a good thought when we get to that point. Uh, Mr. Peterson? Yeah, some good, some good questions there. The um, I'm not sure if it's gonna be perfectly aligned to your question, Commissioner Look, but um, MnDOT, in the last leg state legislative session was asked to uh, deliver a report back to the legislature by February of 2022 that gets at some of your questions about where um, the money's derived versus spent. And so that seems like the waiting for that report to come back and maybe they perhaps they can do a presentation even to this group, but um, they're going to have the most accurate information, I think, to answer your question. But that's in the near term, too. So um, this was uh, an issue that took about 40 minutes of conversation at the exec committee. And as we talked about how we've been doing it in recent solicitations where we put that geographic balance lens over the various options that we're considering at the end of the scoring uh, and, and thought about whether we want to have, because one of the questions raised in, one of the, in the memo was, well, do you want to have a guarantee a uh, minimum guarantee or a scoring mechanism in place that recognizes a geographic balance. After the exec committee finishes, finished its conversation, uh, the answer was no, uh, that we do not want to have a, we would not recommend from the exec committee that we have a minimum guarantee or a scoring mechanism in place that recognizes geographic balance. That we continue utilizing the objective scoring systems that we put in place in all these different categories and that we, we leave it to the judgment and wisdom of the tab uh, at, at the end of the solicitation process to look at all the different options and, and have that conversation like we've had the past few solicitations on what do we want to adjust some projects that might be on the bubble if we think uh, there, there's some imbalance there some way, somehow. So that was, uh, that, that in, a, in a summary fashion is what the um, exec committee thought. And I think it was a, it was a common feeling through all the members of the exec committee. Mayor Hovland, if you could comment on that. This is John Ulrich. Commissioner Ulrich, go ahead. Yeah, I would say, you know, for all the time I've been on the tab, which is 20 years of punishment, but basically, <laughs> <laughs> anyhow, uh, what you're describing has what we've been doing and it's been working where it's been an informal uh, look and saying, okay, uh, is there anything geographically in terms of balance that we're missing here. And I, I favorite staying informal like that, and not a, a hard criteria, but I, just as you have indicated. Yeah, and I think you and I have been on the tab long enough to remember when the, everything was objective and the tab really had no role other than sort of rubber stamping the technical work. And, and we, we changed that in two years ago so the tab's voice could be heard in this process and, and judgment and wisdom could be employed from all our tab members and making these decisions. And I think at least for the last two or three solicitations, it's worked really well, where we've had just about consensus on the decisions that we make uh, at the end of the day. So that's that's kind of where the exec committee ended up to, Commissioner Ulrich. Um, so if, unless somebody wants a poll on that issue, 
uh, Commissioner Karwaski. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I'm uh, along the lines of Commissioner Ulrich, uh, no application change and really no necessary for a scoring change, but I did like the comment Tech made that the geographic balance uh, can be evaluated over time. I think uh, we've done things to help on decision making at the time of, like Chair Hovland mentioned, when we come down for the final votes, we can put some geographic balance in and, and pragmatically uh, uh, try to create some fairness uh, that it's not a perfect science. Uh, <clears throat> But you know, our county, as an example, just went to 50 cents on the, uh, the that tax, transportation tax, because we are getting underfunded by the fe uh, federal solicitation. State funding is also underfunding. Uh, if you looked at the charts, we're consistently getting back about half of what we're paying in. And there's other counties in the same boat. Um, but I must thank staff for all this data and preparation. But what I would like TAB board to consider, and it wouldn't change the application, wouldn't change the scoring, but let's say no one county could get over 45% of the total solicitation money. Put a cap and then that would free up some, some dollars that would get distributed around the region. Uh, I think it's worth, uh considering um thank you mr chair thank you commissioner i take it that's something you just want us to consider when we get to that point in time and not something you want to pull on now yeah you're on mute again commissioner but i, I got the gist I of think it. it's a, a <laughs> easy way to direct staff when we rate score projects, if any one county goes over a certain capped amount, that means they, you know, you just move on to the other priorities. It, so the solicitation, the scoring, the application can be, stay all the same, but we're giving, I think, some uh, direction uh, to further uh, get geographical balance. It intrigues me. So maybe we can discuss this. Uh, Maybe there's time in September. I, I don't think we should, uh, <clears throat> the new ideal, I don't think we should uh, survey it. Yeah, well, maybe to your point, we should send it to the technical people and have them analyze it. That would be great, Mr. Chair, I'd appreciate that. All right, and then I think, um, let's see, uh, I know or Member Geisler has his hand up and then it was uh, Commissioner Look again. Yeah, I just wanted to thank staff for looking at this in and, and the fact that, you know, we're looking at it from a county level, from a state district level, from a northwest quadrant level, from a uh, council district level, from population versus jobs versus vehicle miles traveled. And, you know, it really does highlight that how we would choose to measure this if we ever did choose to measure it can be very influential in what happens with the numbers. It's not, there's not a very clear linear line for every single one of them between pops and jobs and uh, vehicle miles and funding and what's not funded and number of projects and total of dollars. And th there's so many ways to slice and dice this. And I, I like that they have presented a very comprehensive view of this in multiple different ways. Um, you know, data is always changing and, you know, population at the end of the day is always still an estimate. It's never 100% accurate. Same thing with vehicle miles, same thing with uh, job job numbers. So, you know, I, I really commend the staff for taking the time to put together this variety of ways to look at this so that we can really think about it in, a, in multiple different avenues. Um, so I just wanted to express that. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Commissioner Look. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as we're talking through this, I, um, I think for me to make a more informed decision on this, uh, I would like to see a breakdown of the percentage of roads and miles by county. I would like to see the percentage of bike ped investment per county. 
and I'd like to see the percentage of dollars of transit spent both past and present per county. And that'll give us a snapshot, I think, of who's road heavy, who's transit heavy, who's, you know, who's uh, asking for more, you know, that sort of thing. So we can then better understand if, um, you know, if you have one county saying, well, we need, we need more of this, you can at least weigh that then against, well, what do you already have? Or in terms of roads, you're saying, let's cut back on roads and bridges. Uh, and you can get a better understanding then of what counties are heavy on roads and bridges that that might disadvantage. All right, thanks, Commissioner. And then um, back to Commissioner Karwaski, did you have your hand up again? Um, I'm, I apologize, I never took it down. Oh, okay. All right, well, probably getting there. Uh, Commissioner Matos Castillo. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to second um, Commissioner Karwaski's comments about a cap, and I don't know if that is appropriate for the technical advisory committee to adjust to or not, or if that's a policy decision. So I, I would actually encourage us to consider that and maybe at a future conversation, but I, I would just like to second that potentially after we get more information as Commissioner Look has uh, requested. Yeah, but uh, fair point. I think sending it to staff and have them figure out, you know, give us some examples of what could occur with a cap uh, will help us make a, a, a better policy decision. So I think sending it there first will be helpful. Thank you for that comment, Commissioner. Mr. Chair. Member Sanger. Yes, two points. Um, number one, one thing that I did not see in this data was any reference to miles driven in traffic that comes from people or comes from vehicles from outside the metro area. And I am wondering, I, I assume frankly, that the brunt of traffic that comes from outside the metro area either goes up and down 35W or goes across 94. And if I don't know if that's true, but I suspect it's true. And if so, I think we also have to take into account the extra um, mileage or maintenance and the extra costs associated with that that accrue to the counties where those two interstates are um, located. The second thing I would want to mention is that I think that this idea of a cap is really not a good one. And the reason for that is, as somebody mentioned earlier today, we are dependent on what projects come in um, for consideration. And so to assume that there will always be sufficient good projects for every county that this kind of a cap would work, I think is pretty simplistic. I think I would much prefer to stick with the, the way we have it now, where we don't have a cap, but we do look when it's time to allocate the money to see how the projects are distributed and to what extent might they be skewed one way or another. Thank you, Member Sanger. All right. Um, I'm going to assume that we've plumbed that topic pretty well here. And Steve, do you want to go on to that subset of that one, the uh, potential maximum minimum changes, or are you going to talk about that primarily in the next portion of the agenda? Yeah, we do. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. I think I think we'll get to it in more depth later. Um, we did want the reason we put it up here in part was because there is a, a connection uh, between project size and opportunities for better geographic balance. You know, obviously, the smaller the project award, it gives you more opportunities to um, spread the money around the region. And, you know, that's that's true to a point. And then you got to weigh that versus a bunch of small projects. But um, we did want the point was to to make that connection between there is some tie between our min max and and geographic balance. All right, very good. So we'll jump by one B or one A B, and we'll jump into the uh, spot mobility issue, spot okay. mobility and safety. Um, maybe I'll share my screen here, Greg, if that's okay. That's that's fine. Okay. Okay, did you see it on the screen? You can. 
Okay. Well, it's under it's under part two now. It's up. Yeah, you're on. There you go. This is spot mobility. Yep. You yep. got it. Okay. Uh, second sub, second topic here. Uh, last month we had a discussion on the spot mobility and safety application category. And again, these are smaller at grade solutions like a new roundabout or turn lanes or reconstruction in an intersection. $3.5 million is the max. So again, smaller projects. Our, our TAC committee has uh, recommended that we increase safety. This was a new category. So we wanted to see how it played out. Um, they're saying given, um, given the increases in uh, fatalities and serious injury crashes we're, we're experiencing on the system, let's bump up safety. Uh, Tab told us last month to come back with three options. Uh, we sent those through to the subcommittees, and that's shown in the, the three different columns here, option one, option two, and option three. Uh, we gave you all the details here uh, because the um, we wanted to show which specific measures you'd have to take on the points from and to, because uh, it makes, makes a difference beyond just the heading of the criteria. Um, what TAC is recommending back to you again is that it, that, that option three on the far right side in the top right corner, we're going to take uh, recommend to take 60 points from role in the regional transportation system. That's 30 points from measure A, which is congestion in the project area, and 30 points from the regional truck corridors. And um, since these projects are usually on um, less less traveled from a freight perspective roadways and put those uh, same 60 points down into uh, safety a and b 50 points into uh, pedestrian crash reduction uh, that would be measure b and the remainder 10 points into the number of crashes reduced and so the out of the three options maybe just briefly option one we pulled all the money out of, or all of the points out of vehicle delay reduced our technical committee said, well, the application name of the application is spot mobility and safety. So we don't want to take all the points out of the vehicle delay reduced because that's really the point of the point of these types of projects. So they said no to option one, option two, risk assessment. Uh, that, that would leave it with essentially 1%. That didn't make, make sense to people. And so that's really why our technical staff is recommending that option three take, uh, because it does take some out of congestion in that measure 1A and the remainder of the truck corridors. And so um, if agreeable uh, today at TAB, what funding and programming will see tomorrow in the action transmittal is option three shown as uh, the point distribution for the spot mobility and safety. So Mr. Chair, back to you. Yeah, thank you, Steve. That was an excellent ex explanation. Uh, and at the exec committee, we, we talked this through thoroughly uh, there was some sentiment towards option one, but when Steve explained that this was kind of the heart of the category uh, and it would be inappropriate to take the points uh, uh, from uh, from 3A, uh, we understood, I think, more fully the, the recommendation around uh, option three, which would add those 60 points to safety, uh, not take points away from uh, air quality uh, air quality improvements or congestion reduction, which is connected to climate change. And uh, that was something that was important to the tab and expressed it so in the prior meeting. So if folks are comfortable with this uh, recommendation from the tab exec and also from staff, uh, we can move forward on that. But certainly if anybody on the tab has a question or concern about why option three, uh, feel free to raise a question or make a comment or make an inquiry if you want to understand it further. Uh, Mr. Chair, I had a I had a question. Is that Mr. Lindeke? Yeah, Member Lindeke, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just um, I'd like you uh, the staff to elaborate on the connection that between vehicle delay reduced measurements, um, which seems like congestion to me, and and uh, and safety. Why are those connected? Uh, could you just uh, describe what the staff argument was at the at the technical committee? Because I don't quite understand um, the, what that means. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair and Member Lindicki. So the, you're asking the application category why it's grouped the way it is. 
Well, you said that you proposed safety. option one and uh, you received some pushback from yeah. someone because uh, vehicle delay reduced is connected to safety or or something like that. And I, I don't quite understand what, what that meant. Oh, yeah. So sorry, maybe I didn't explain that well. So the, the application category is called spot mobility and safety. Uh, going into this solicitation, those are both weighted equally, 25% each of the total points. Uh, when we proposed option one, which was to take it out of um, congestion reduction or mobility, they said, well, that's the re that's part of the reason for the category is to uh, you know increase flow through through the intersection area and increase safety. So we want to keep keep both of those high, but an emphasis now where the primary um, point total would go to safety. Okay, all right. That's helpful. Thanks, Member Lindigy. Anyone else? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair. Member Sanger. Um, on one level, this does make sense to me, but on another level, I have a question about when you're allocating more points to uh, promote uh, interchange work to try to uh, decrease pedestrian uh, injuries. I'm wondering what data do we have that shows that the reason for these pedestrian injuries is because of flawed engineering design at the intersection? As in other words, how do we know that fixing intersections will make a difference at, or to what extent are a lot of these um, pedestrian injuries due to uh, bad behavior and law enforcement issues uh, for the drivers and the pedestrians. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and Member saying it's, it's a um, complicated question. Uh, Heidi Schallberg from our staff has done the pedestrian action safety plan recently that presented to you, and she's probably most adept at answering it, but it, I think the answer is it's a mix of two. Um, behavioral and intersection design probably trending more towards behavioral at this point from from what uh, we're tracking. Um, you know, Brian, I don't know Brian Isaacson wants to add anything to that too, but I think uh, it's probably probably our safety ped safety planner Heidi Schauberg is probably the best to, to respond to you at a future date. Well, okay, I hope she will do that. And I'm willing to support this at this time, but I would hope that if we get um, applications that are going to be receiving extra points about this, that there be some way in the application for them to have to substantiate why making an engineering design change to the intersection will, in fact, um, cut down on, on uh, pedestrian injury. Very good. Yeah, I think Brian, our tech chair uh, for the day, is that <laughs> clean for a day? Yeah. Um, uh, I, I just throw a couple comments in there, if I could, Mr. Chair. Yeah, and, and please. It, it's a really good question, and I think um, I can appreciate the concern being that if we're saying the way that this looks to you probably looks like we could end up with a really large intersection that's harder, which has harder to cross, which has better flow and the concern would be have we actually improved it for the pedestrian but i'll say i think that the volunteers who end up scoring these applications do a really good job of sussing out whether what's being proposed is really going to address what they're getting points for or not and i think that they do a good job of flagging things that are not going the way that the points are supposed to be awarded so does that help well from the 30,000 foot level, yes. But <laughs> as applied, I, I don't have enough detail. Fair enough. Mr. Chair? Yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm sure we can pull together some information and resend out the pedestrian um, safety um, presentation. But in addition, um, even when you look at some of these um, inter interchanges that may be in a more rural area, maybe not used by pedestrians, by changing, doing a spot mobility fix, um, I think in particular about a couple of roundabouts that um, were put into place in Scott County, 
um, that made an incredible difference in safety. Um, they uh, not only um, vastly reduced um, fatalities, but also serious car injuries or serious injuries and, and all of the like. And so, you know, when I think of this category, I think we need to think of that as well. So sometimes it's not always a pedestrian-based interchange. It can be, but we need to make sure we're thinking about some of these rural interchanges as well. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Member Sanger. Thanks everybody for your input on that issue. All right, I think um, we're safe moving forward, uh, moving beyond spot mobility and safety, uh, understanding that uh, at least for the time being, for purposes of getting to the next month, uh, recommendation number three is the the information staff ought to take with them that that's supported, that their recommendation and the tax recommendation is endorsed. Uh, let's move on to equity now, and Amy Venowitz has this particular section. Sure, Mr. Chair and members, we have about 10 slides on the equity and affordable housing scoring. I'm gonna go through them pretty quickly. Um, I'll cover how we scored it in 2020, some observations about what we saw in the applicant responses last uh, solicitation, and then how we're proposing to change the scoring moving forward. So Steve, are you still doing the slides? Oh, thank you. I am, okay, yes. This, thank you. Um, this first slide really is not the scoring itself. This is how the equity and housing performance criteria is weighted. So on the left hand, you see all of the criteria, and then across the top, you see the 12 um, application categories. So the criteria weighting ranges from 10% in the roadways, uh, 15 to 20 in the transit categories, and 12% in the bike and ped categories. I wanna be clear that we are not proposing changing the weighting of this criteria, but I will go through how we are proposing to change how the criteria is scored. Next slide. So in the 2020 application, we had four scoring measures, two for equity and two for housing. Uh, the two for equity were engagement and benefits and impacts to equity populations. In addition uh, to benefits, there was a potential to receive negative points if there were negative impacts that were not addressed. On the housing side, we had the housing performance score and the affordable housing access score. Next slide. So uh, previously on engagement, we looked at uh, each applicant had to map populations within a half mile of the pr proposed project, and then um, talk about how they've engaged the communities that they identified and then described benefits and impacts that the project would provide specifically to those communities. It did not, uh, we did not want the applicant to just talk about general benefits. They had to be very specific impacts to the equity populations. And then in 2020, we had the opportunity for applicants that scored very well on those two measures, 80% or above, to achieve bonus points. And I'll talk about those in a minute. On the housing side, we have had a housing performance score as a measure um, well before 2020. I think that actually stretches back into the 1990s. This score is a community-based score. It is not a project-oriented score. So our community development division assigns a housing performance score to each community within the region. And then we use those scores in the past. We've used those scores within the regional solicitation. In 2020, we also added a new scoring measure called affordable housing access. Under this scoring measure, we asked applicants to map affordable housing within a half mile of the project, and then in a qualitative manner, describe how their project 
would improve access directly to the site or to specific dis destinations that were near the site that might include schools, daycares, um, churches, other types of um, uh, destinations. So uh, next slide. Uh, the bonus points, which also were new in 2020, that replaced what a uh, multiplier that we had used in the past that was based on geography. The bonus points changed that and gave bonus points to those applicants that scored, as I said, at least 80% on the equity measures in the geographic areas shown below. So the points varied based upon what type of geographic area the project was located in. In 2020, we had 10 projects that did receive bonus points. They were very well geographically distributed throughout the region. They were not centered within the urban region or urban areas necessarily, or the core urban areas anyway. And I believe nine of the 10 projects that received bonus points last solicitation were eventually funded as part of our program. Next slide. So a couple observations. I was a scorer during 2020 along with four other individuals and um, we used similar questions and talked before scoring so that we were all kind of uh, trying to use the same framework in our scoring. Um, overall, we had a lot of projects that scored very low, specifically on the engagement piece uh, a lot of engagement has not taken place on many of these projects. The applicant did talk about future engagement, but we did not score based on future engagement. We had a few projects that scored kind of in the medium range. Those projects tended to have done a little bit of engagement, but did not necessarily connect the project well to the benefits that would be provided to specific equity populations. And then the high scoring projects that we saw had really gone um, above and beyond. Engagement had already occurred. The input that the engagement, and this is engagement with specifically with equity populations, not general engagement. And the input that was heard or uh, received in that process was used to influence the project design and project purpose. Uh, the applicant did a good job of connecting the project specifically to benefits that would be provided to the equity populations. In the area of housing, they had done mapping that included not just the affordable housing, but destinations and had made observations about how the project would better connect the affordable housing locations, which I should note represent our low-income individuals, so they are part of the equity populations, and they did a good job of really describing how the project would better connect them to specific types of destinations. Next slide. A uh, couple other uh, observations. Uh, storytelling really seemed to be a good approach for the high scoring applicants. Really talking about why are we doing this project? Who is the project going to impact? How is it going to better connect them to specific destinations? Um, and then also the applicants that scored high did a good job of differentiating among who they engaged with. As I said, we really weren't looking for general engagement. We were looking for engagement that was specifically aimed at equity populations and had specific benefits targeted to those populations. One thing I would note is that the Safe Routes to School applicants um, Generally, those were some of the best applications we saw on the equity criteria. They very much, those at heart, those applications are about improving access to schools through walking and biking and 
many of those applications really did an outstanding job on engagement. Next slide. So moving into 2022, based on what we saw, we do have some recommended changes for the scoring. In general, we're trying to better connect the equity with the affordable housing piece and talk about them more holistically and look at them as one measure, not really two separate measures. The biggest change that we are um, suggesting is that we drop the housing performance score. So the housing performance score, as I mentioned, is not really a project-based score. It reflects how a specific community is doing on affordable housing. We have had many, many comments in the past from applicants that they don't really appreciate this measure because it's not something they can specifically control or even necessarily if it's a county applicant, the score is based on a city's housing performance. And so the, the connection there has always been a little bit weak for some of the applicants. Uh, what we also heard is that the access to affordable housing, the new measure was very uh, hard and took time and it only had 10 points associated with it. So there was a general feeling of, if we're gonna do this much work on a specific measure, it should have more points associated with it. So we are responding to those comments, suggesting that we eliminate the housing performance score and to a large degree, move those points into the affordable housing access measure. Next slide. So these, uh, this last slide shows how the points would be distributed across the application categories and then across the three measures that we are, are now suggesting we use. So the first measure continues to be engagement with equity populations, and that would include residents of affordable housing who, as I said, are represent our low income residents. Uh, then a measure looking at the benefits and impacts to the populations that are ad identified near the project. And then the third measure, mapping the affordable housing locations and specifically talking about how the project will better provide access or better connect residents of affordable housing to specific destinations. And then the total points possible remains unchanged uh, across all the application categories. And you can see that on the far right. And I, maybe there's one more slide about bonus. And then finally for bonus points, we are proposing to keep the bonus points. One change would be that it, the bonus points would apply only if the applicant received 80% of the points across all of the three measures, including the housing access measure. And then we are also proposing to eliminate the geography associated with areas of concentrated poverty and 50% people of color. We formerly refer referred to these geographies as ACP 50s. This is a reference that the council is no longer using. And um, so we are spreading, we're getting rid of that reference to that geography and then spreading the bonus points as shown here across areas of concentrated poverty with 25 points, 15 points for projects that are in census tracts with a regional average for poverty, uh, with poverty above the regional average and then 10 points for areas, all other areas. So that's a quick overview of how we're proposing to change the equity and affordable housing scoring. This was presented to both funding and programming and TAC. They had very few comments and were supportive of the proposed changes. And so I can answer any questions, but generally, what we are proposing is that in the action that will move forward tomorrow with funding and programming, 
that this change will be incorporated as part of changing the scoring measures. So that is all I have, Mr. Chair, and I can take any questions. Yeah, uh, that was very thorough. Thank you, Amy. Uh, questions for Ms. Venowitz? Mr. Chair, Mary Giuliani Stevens here. Um, Amy, I really like the direction this is taking. Um, I just had a, a couple of questions. I can't, I can't remember when we did it before the rationale for the bonus points. So maybe just remind me again why we're doing that when we're making these changes. I, and I really like the direction of the changes. And then secondly, I noticed that in the affordable housing, it talked about subsidized affordable housing. Um, and I was wondering why that was narrow and it wasn't a broader, including naturally occurring affordable housing or other things. So if you'd address those two, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Sure. Mr. Chair and members, I'm going to take your second question first. So um, when we ask, we're proposing that when we ask applicants to map affordable housing, we are going to supply them with an application that will help them do this app do the mapping as part of the application and that program has data related to subsidized affordable housing in the scoring text and directions to applicants we recognize that there are other types of affordable housing and offer um, or encourage really that they also tell us about naturally occurring affordable housing or planned affordable housing that can't be mapped necessarily with our program. And if possible, they can um, provide additional attachments showing locations of other types of affordable housing. So we would consider that as part of the scoring. We just don't have the capability to set up a mapping program that can include that on a map. So that's your uh, first question. This first question about the bonus points. So one, when we first started doing equity scoring in 2014, there was a recognition that projects that were located in areas with high populations of um, equity populations and um, people in poverty or people of color were that really those projects would clearly benefit a higher number of individuals in those categories. And so when we first designed the equity scoring, we gave higher points to projects located in those geographies. And we did it by scoring and then multiplying the score by 100% for what we then called ACP 50s, 80% for areas of concentrated poverty, 60% for those above the regional average, and then 40% for all other locations. And what that actually does is it takes points away from applicants. And so we would score it, and then we would actually reduce the points based on the geographic location. And had applicants who really did a great job on the questions overall. They had really done engagement, everything else, and yet due to the geographic location, they lost points. And um, clearly that made a lot of our applicants kind of unhappy. So what we decided to do instead was to get rid of the multiplier which reduced points and instead we added bonus points and the bonus points you can only get them if you've already done a great job on all of the equity and affordable housing questions you score 80 percent and then we base the bonus points on the geographic location and that just seemed to be a better more acceptable approach it doesn't kind of result in um penalizing any applicants. And then I will also note it also for those projects which clearly are kind of aiming at an equity focus or have equity benefits, it gives them extra points. And at the beginning when I showed the criteria weighting, it really brings them up and weights the equity criteria higher than we normally would 
um, but only for those applicants that really have a project that is aimed at equity populations. Thank you. Excellent job on, on both of my questions. That, and you specifically answered the first one. I, I just wanted to make sure that carrying that bonus through, there was a good explanation for it when you made the other changes in it. You know, clearly there is, because then you're, re you're rewarding those projects that are going to score higher in that area. Um, but overall, I really, I like the direction, you know, you're taking in these changes. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Member Stevens. Mayor? Yes. Member uh, Sanger? Yes. I have to say, this is the first time that I really, really realized that engagement points are only awarded based on engagement with BIPOC populations. And as a former um, city council member, I am well aware that no matter what the project is, there is going to be a lot of feedback from the immediate neighbors of a proposed project, no matter whether they're BIPOC or not. And at, at least in some communities, maybe many communities, the nearby residents of a proposed project are going to be presumably a mix of people, whether they are BIPOC populations or not. And so I am frankly concerned that why are we only taking into account the views of equity populations rather than the views of anybody who lives in the near, nearby area who wants to comment on it? Mr. Mr. Chair and members, I do want to assure you that um, what I'm addressing today is just engagement with specific equity populations, as I generally refer to them. Um, and I want to remind everyone that our definition for this purpose is broader than just poverty, uh, low income and people of color. It also includes disabled youth and um, senior populations. Uh, but in terms of general engagement, we do have another measure within the regional solicitation. It falls under the risk assessment measure. Very clearly, every project is required to have engagement with its populations. Um, so we do expect that. And under the risk assessment, each applicant is asked to talk about the general engagement that they have done and in some instances intend to do with the project overall. Um, but in the equity scoring, we try to recognize the importance of specifically engaging with equity populations in a more direct um, way. And, and that the equity points are based on benefits aimed specifically at those populations. So the, those two measures appear in different places in the application itself. Thank you. All right. Any other follow on folks? I just wanted to remind everybody we've already had some members having to leave. It's 235. We've got 25 minutes uh, and we haven't even gotten to section two yet. So uh, is there anyone that uh, does not agree with the recommended staff changes for start points or for um, uh, for the equity. Is, is everybody comfortable with the equity and affordable housing approach? I guess is a more succinct way to put it. Comfortable with it, sir. Yeah, get it, we'll get to the um, get to the September meeting anyway. All right. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, Steve, look there has, any... Commissioner Look has his hand up. Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in the beginning of the presentation, there was an identification of 10 projects that were benefited by this scoring criteria. Um, can I get a list of locations of those 10 projects, would that be possible? And then um, I just have an overarching kind of question and that is, um, you know, we're talking about, you know, equity and trying to achieve equity. And I'm wondering if we've established a matrix of uh, where we're going and when we get there. Ms. Venowitz. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair and members, it uh, definitely, we will supply you with the listing of the projects that received the bonus points. And um, in terms of a matrix, I, I, we do not have a matrix. We are um, working on measures 
at the council and, uh, and specifically in transportation, uh, we've been working with MnDOT on identifying specific transportation equity measures. And we will come back and have a discussion with TAB on those measures and how to use them in our processes. And once, once you have those specific measures, that's really when you can begin to set targets is I think what you're getting at is, where are we trying to go? What are we trying to change? And um, the measures discussion will help us understand that better. Any follow on, Commissioner? Well, Mr. Chair, I just think that if we're, you know, since 2014, we've been working on this and we don't have a measure in sight, isn't that putting the cart in front of the horse a little bit? I think we need to try, try and establish where we want to get to so we can plan on getting there. Um, and so far, it's just identifying a, a topic, not really identifying where we're going with the topic, but it seems like it's going to perpetuity by the sounds of it. And I'm not sure that that's necessarily responsible if we don't really know where we've succeeded and to what extent we need to succeed. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, I think we, with equity, we need to recognize its intersectionality with a lot of other things that we're trying to achieve within the region, whether it's housing and jobs, and there are many different areas that intersect with transportation and equity. And um, I, I think I would encourage us to think that we have a long way to go and, and um, having our projects help a little bit along the way is a good expectation. I would also suggest this one, this measure is not specifically different from our other measures where we don't necessarily, such as in safety, uh, have a specific goal we're trying to achieve. We, Mr. Chair, we are um, trying to get to zero deaths. I know those are uh, quantifiable measures for safety. Um, so I, I think um, I think we need to establish it. I know that we've had that expectation for transit as well. When when an applicant says, "Hey, we're going to increase ridership by X number," we've talked about this before on Tab, where we've said, "Well, let's validate that you've actually increased the the transport uh, the the ridership by X number." And so, on the same token, I think it's reasonable to say if we expect to solve of equity that we should have some sort of matrix to establish have we solved equity all right comment noted um i think we've got to keep moving here now um it is a, a topic that's ripe for a lot of good conversation there's no question about that uh Steve, I'm going to, I think we get general acceptance that we can get to September 30th uh, on the equity and affordable housing presentation that Amy made and we're supporting staff's uh, recommendation there. Okay. Uh, did you have any other technical measures that you wanted to talk about under that uh, as a subcategory uh, there, or do you want to just move on to unique projects? Um, I, yeah, this is more for transparency's sake, we did make several changes that we worked through with the technical committees to reflect uh, COVID and the declining transit ridership and roadway traffic volume declines. So uh, that's what this slide is meant to entail, kind of what our approach is on both of those items. Um, and we don't need to necessarily go through it now. We vetted it pretty strongly with our technical committees and a transit work group. I do have a, a response or an answer to uh, Member Sanger's uh, question on pedestrian safety that Heidi Schalberg, I was able to track her down. Yeah, Heidi, you there? Yes. Yes. Um, there she is. Schalberg, go Thanks. ahead. Yeah, Mr. Chair and members, yeah, apologies when you th think you're anticipating when your item will be always miscalculated. <laughs> so apologies for not hearing the question earlier. Um, so I understand there was a question as far as like how, how we're anticipating the infrastructure changes would improve pedestrian safety. Is that... Accurate. That, that's a fair generalization okay. in that one category. I'll just try to briefly address that. Um, you know, first we know that infrastructure does influence behavior. Um, so it's something that can help influence drivers to drive slower, um, to increase visibility for pedestrians. 
Um, and so it's really an important part of the safe systems approach that we're taking with that plan and that's increasingly becoming more common um, in safety planning nationwide where we're really trying to look at building systems that have some redundancy because we recognize that people make mistakes, right? Like we're not all gonna be able to be 100% perfect humans every day. And so, but when someone makes a mistake, it shouldn't result in death or serious injury. Um, I will just kind of say that another thing, especially with pedestrian crashes is that there does tend to be a little bit of randomness in where they happen. So it's, um, you know, protect, perhaps more important to be proactive in the approach and take a systemic look um, because rather than just kind of chasing where each one happens, um, looking at what those risk factors are across the network and trying to address that more holistically. And so the recommendations um, in this measure were kind of based on the data analysis that's been done to date as part of that plan. That is helpful, Member Sanger. Kind of. Here's here's my more specific question. Do we have data that analyzes um, pedestrian serious injuries or death by cause of the accident? Now, what I'm wondering is to what extent are the primary causes of these accidents due to you know bad driver behavior or bad pedestrian behavior as opposed to being due to um, bad intersection design, for example, or, or, or infrastructure type reasons? Um, Member Sanger, we did do some of that data analysis in the historic data, and I can go back and just double check for some of the more specific references that we maybe didn't present to TAB. And that I will say we didn't go into the full depth of behavior changes. There are actually a lot of um, a lot of issues with maybe how those necessarily get coded on crash reports um, that are completed by police. And of course, if you're a pedestrian and you're you're seriously injured or dead, you, you know that's that side of it is is not usually well. Um, accounted for or, or always well represented. Um, so the really the primary focus was kind of what like what the actions were and like where they were, whether they were crossing or walking along. Um, by far the most common um, issue is when somebody is crossing the street. Um, and I'd be happy to follow up with, with slides on some of the other ones. But the, the primary focus of this is not primarily on trying to assign blame to a driver or to a pedestrian. Um, that's been kind of more of a traditional approach to traffic safety and, and quite frankly, we're not seeing our numbers change a lot from from that kind of approach. Um, and so that's where kind of the safe systems approach really is trying to take a look at even if someone makes a mistake, um, how can we set up our systems so that that doesn't mean somebody dies or is seriously injured from that. So it's a little bit of a shift in trying to th in how we're thinking about it. Thank you, Ms. Schulberg. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for being here. All right. What I'm wondering, Steve, is I know that yep. we've got unique projects in two places. Uh, it's in 1D, and then we've got it again in 2C. Uh, I'm wondering if we shouldn't, uh, if for purposes of efficiency with 15 minutes left, if we shouldn't keep moving into and go into part two. Sure. Let's do it. All right. So, folks, remember, we talked about this in July, and, and we had some general questions, and I, I I think I posited, uh, does anybody have any issue with uh, some of these different categories? So the way this portion of the agenda is set up, and Steve mentioned this earlier, they set it up in a way where uh, we think we're moving from uh, topics where there is no um, question that we want, we got a fairly uniform opinion on just moving it forward with the staff recommendation. Uh, and then we move to the progressively more difficult ones to discuss. And I think, frankly, the uh, there's three of them probably. We've got to talk about unique projects uh, category. And remember, Barbara has a, uh, a question she wants to raise with the group in terms of the weighting. Uh, and then with uh, G&H, the modal funding ranges and the potential minimum maximum changes, that was where the rubber hit the road in the last meeting. And so I think we want to try to quickly move through uh, the first elements of this. So I want to ask uh, Steve, I don't know if you have anything you want to do from a slide standpoint here. Yeah, you've got slides up on qualifying eligibility decisions. So go ahead. Yeah, so the first couple are, um, we, we put the easier ones first, I should say, um, where I thought there was, we thought there was pretty good consensus. 
Uh, a is the qualifications and the eligibility decisions. And on each of these slides at the bottom, we'll, we'll show what the current expectation is in bold for the application uh, going tomorrow. Um, so again, in, in this one, minimal changes, uh, except for a few minor adjustments to qualifying and eligibility. And that's that we didn't hear anything from Tab last month on this on this factor. That's right. Anybody want to raise anything now? Otherwise, we'll move on to the next one and and uh, assume that the Tab's position is the same. Give the staff the guidance they need here. Uh, no substantial change, except for a few minor adjustments. Okay, Steve, let's move on. Yep. Uh B is the application categories and purpose statements. And again, at the bottom of the slide, we we're saying the current expectation is that we will keep the application categories the same as they were last cycle in 2020. The only addition is the new purpose statements. We wrote a purpose statement for each, each application category. And that was based on a recommendation in our before and after uh, study that was presented to you. Again, at tab, we didn't hear last month at tab, we, did, we didn't hear any uh, calls for, for change on these categories. That's, that's what my notes show too, that was with respect to categories and, and purpose statements, the recommendation uh, was that they stay the same from the tab. Anybody have a contrary thought? Okay, let's 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 assume that uh, we're good to go there, and then move on uh, to unique projects. Yes, yeah, C is the unique project technical uh, feedback, and again, we uh, Cole presented to you last month with a, a rather lengthy PowerPoint on all the details of the application process, the maximum min, um, et cetera, and um, did want to come back to you. Uh, to see if there are any changes to what he had uh, presented. Nicole, anything else to add there, if you're somewhere? I know we heard from the technical committees along the way that uh, they'd like to be more privy to um, providing at least technical input uh, into this scoring and selection process. Uh, yeah, you remember folks that yeah. the uh, projects that are in this category, the ones that didn't fit in other categories, uh, that was the original purpose. And the purpose statement added flexibility in case uh, there are projects that fit into a gray area or uh, where they should apply, especially if a project is unique. Um, I think members were fine with the outcome of the criteria weighting of the work group, um, but uh, member Barber, uh, if you remember, and I think Steve, can you put those up to the Mentimeter? We did the Mentimeter result yeah. and uh, the weighting criteria, innovation was number one. Uh, because that was a constant all the way through the conversation. Uh, air quality and environmental impact were number two, and equity was third. Right. Uh, and that was through the through the Mentimeter process of polling, basically uh, the right. members in the uh, that were involved in the work group. Uh, Member right. Barber has a suggestion coming from the council that um, we uh, we balance out number two and number three so that the uh, reducing adverse environmental environmental, Im, environmental impacts and improve racial equity uh, be uh, generalized to be uh, equal. Um, so, yes. uh, Member Barbara, I'll let you uh, give your uh, reasons for that, why you sure. think that should be something we consider. Sure, so during the work group meetings, we did have to rank one over the other and things like that, but I think really the will of the group was we had two key focus areas that we wanted to um, look to. Obviously, everyone agreed the highest priority was something that was innovative, so I think that stays the same, but I think that the uh, reducing adverse environmental impacts and improving racial equity are both um, high priorities for the region. Um, even if we go to the conversation earlier about the public comment period, that those are the themes that we're hearing that are coming out. And so I think if we can um, actually balance them and give those equal weighting, still keeping innovation at the highest, but showing that we are, we see both um, needs for um, uh, using this category to focus on the reduction of adverse environmental impacts and improving racial equity rather than one over the other. 
All right. So this is a thought that's come from you, Member Barber, or from the Met Council. Where is it? What's the origin? There's multiple of multiple council members. So both um, uh, Council Member Fredson and I both served on the work group, and then um, we had that conversation. And then um, um, after the work group, that we wanted to see the weighting balanced. And um, I've heard similar things from others of my colleagues as well. All right. So, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, Mary Giuliani Stevens here. Um, I was also part of the, the working group and I guess I'm not comfortable with changing the percentages. Um, they did come out of the hard work of the, of that working group. And so I support those percentages as determined by that group. And I think the percentages are reflective of the tip comments that we just talked about at length at great length earlier in this meeting. Um, you know, and the importance of those comments. So, um, yeah, I just, I think when you appoint a working group and you ask them to work hard and do the work, um, I understand that not everybody, you know, is comfortable with the end numbers and things, but this is what the group came up with. And I guess I support it. Thank you. Thank you. Member Stevens. Anyone else? Hi, uh, Mr. Chair. Member Hollinshead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I too support the uh, percentages as they are shown on the graphic. Uh, I was part of the work group and sometimes it's not easy to uh, um, acknowledge uh, an area that's underserved compared to an area that is uh, even less served. Um, but I do think these percentages are, are the will of the work group and I do think they might matter. So I would support them in the way they are. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Member Hollinshead. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Yeah, Mr. Member Geisler. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as also a member of the work group, uh, I'll just remind folks that actually we did talk about making these two equal during the work group, and we proposed that as an option. Um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, uh, in every other piece that we got to before we got to specific percentages. Environmental impacts and equity were basically neck and neck the entire way through as level of importance to the entire work group through the six week process or six meeting process. So I, I do think that may, making them match out equally uh, does represent the will of what we were talking about over the extended period of time. Um, considering that this poll was put in a percentage for how much you think these should go to and uh, added up to 100%. Uh, in my opinion, changing any given one of these by a couple percentage points up or down to match other conversations we're having as a tab it is immaterial. Um, they're still staying at, a, at the same rating, in my, my, in my opinion. So if they were equal, I would be okay with that. Others? Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Yeah. Dan Karwaski here. Yeah, I support the work group. Um, I was part of the work group. Um, you know, there's six categories here. Um, these are all the three top three we're talking about take on greater importance. Also, in my opinion, uh, the reason to keep them the same and support the work group is that, you know, equity is certainly in uh, racial equity is really important, but we do cover that in other areas of tab where uh, this reducing adverse environmental impacts is kind of, in my mind, an innovative area. You know, we have innovation and it's it's more of a unique uh, characteristic that I don't think we see covered. So I, I really strongly support the percentages as presented. All right, Thank Member Hollins, did you have your hand back up? Yeah, I just wanted to note that uh, uh, amongst uh, many uh, environmental advocates, um, environmental justice is absolutely at the core and incorporated into um, environmental impact uh, mitigation. And so I think that uh, that blue bar there, uh, actually, uh, if you ask environmental advocates and leaders, uh, you will find out that uh, racial equity is part of that. Uh, so that's another reason that I think these Percentages are are accurate and a, a faithful uh, re, uh, result of the work group's uh, activities. So thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. What I what I'm wondering is whether this is something we need to pull on as a group or whether um, it can. Mr. 
you know, we'll stand with the Mentimeter results. Uh, if those folks that want to achieve achieve some uh, balancing of categories two and three uh, uh, want to, want this issue pulled, I'll do it. I'd like to have Mr. the group pulled. Yeah. Who is that? Yes. Is that member Barber? Yes. All right. Yes. Okay. This doesn't require a second. This doesn't require a second. And it's not like Mr. a control. Remember that. Mr. Chair, did you have something you wanted to say? Yes, yes, quickly. Uh, there was a suggestion, I think it was Member Geisler brought it up at the work group that we round we round all the figures, and I think it was an innovation going to 30, and then the adverse uh, environmental and racial equity going to 20, et cetera, et cetera. And that did not uh, that was not uh, a pass, if you will. That so they we kept the individual percentages, and that would be um why i would support individual percentages although i must say to go against the uh, to disagree with the brilliance of member barber and member guys it's, it's hard for me <laughs> all right here's the here's the poll question i think and that is uh you should say i if you are in favor of adopting the criteria weighting poll results that you see on the screen Those in favor of adopting the criteria weighting poll results shown on the screen should say aye on the poll. Mr. Aye. Chair. Aye. Ernst, we had to do this by roll call, remember. Mr. Chair, can I can I clarify something? This is Cole. Yeah, Cole Henniker. There's an error in this slide. Um, the rounding of Mentimeter, all the percentages only add up to 99%. So I just wanted to note that we have to make one correction and one suggestion I would make is maybe we just put that extra percentage point in equity and make that up to 18%. And that you guys assume that that's the default, if that's fair. Member Sanger, did you have something you wanted to say? No. Okay. Your your uh, your screen lit up. That's why I asked. Oh. You maybe have maybe you're having a sidebar there. Um, all right. So does that change uh, your mind, Member Barber, on doing a poll? No. All right, let's pull it. All right. So, so uh, Mr. Chair, before you start, if I may. Yes. If, if we don't vote aye, then then are, are we going to do? Maybe I got lost here. What are we going to? Then what happens? But then we're going to have to vote on whether or not you want to balance out two and three. So this is basically to say it stays, and then if it. That gets voted down, then we have another vote about changing it. I think we'll have to. These are professional. Okay. All right. Unless you want to build in the assumption that uh, a nay vote means that uh, we're going to balance them. Well, that's why I guess it's. it's in the it's, interest of time, that would make sense. <laughs> It's kind of a hard vote when you don't really know what direction we're going. Let's let's do this vote. That's we're wasting time here. Let's do this vote, and uh, because we're running out of time, I'm really here. We are at the three o'clock mark, and we haven't even talked about the two heavy categories yet. And I got to be somewhere at three thirty. All right. Um, the question is: Those, in, if you're in favor of adopting the criteria weighting poll results shown on the screen, you vote aye. Uh, Jenna Ernst. Anderson. Aye. Bailey. He left. Uh, Barber. No. Barnes. Or, sorry, Calby. Boyles. Aye. Crimmins. Aye. Dugan. 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 <laughs> sorry, Dugan. Dugan. Aye. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Foster. Aye. Fox. Geisler. Nay. Cattell. Aye. Giuliani Stevens. Aye. Hansen. Aye. Holberg. Aye. Collinshead. Aye. Karwaski. Aye. Keeley. Aye. Linda Key. No. 
Look. Aye. Uh, Colash. Aye. Mattis Castillo. Aye. Narayanan. Aye. Petrick. Aye. Reich. Reich. Sanger. Aye. Schember. Aye. Stephenson. He had to go to a meeting. Uh, Jalali. Ulrich. Aye. Coughlin. Aye. Windshuttle. Aye. Workman. Aye. All right, so three nays, Chair. Yes, I have it. Um, 23 ayes, three nays. The motion carries. Staff has the direction they need. Yeah. All right, um, now we're on to um, project selection guarantees and limits. Steve? I'm sure the uh, expectation here is that uh, no no changes will take place. Um, you can see see what the guarantees are, both for functional class and a lot of the transit changes that were made in 2020 are shown on the screen here. Yeah, I mean, it, that last month we reviewed the previous guarantees for functional classification, bridge funding targets, ABRT, total BRT funding, I'm looking at my notes, and yeah. transit and uh, new market. Uh, we had some discussion around all those issues, but tab uh, at the end of the day recommended no changes to the current guarantees. Is that the sentiment today? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I think it is. I'm not hearing anything to the positive or negative there. Can I, are we correct in assuming that we can uh, follow this uh, prior recommendation that tab made in in, in July? Yes. No, change, no changes to the current guarantees. People comfortable yes. with that? Okay. Yes. All right. Yes. All right. Let's go to uh, the two uh, potentially thorny ones. They may not be, but uh, let's take those on. Steve. Like okay. Getting, getting the right PowerPoint back up there for you. All right. Well, I guess they aren't, we aren't to the thorny ones yet. We're still at application uh, criteria waiting. Yeah, so uh, Mr. Chair, so this was this was one. Um, this is the percent of the total points for each of the application categories. You can is it a table you see on the screen? Yeah, it's on the screen. Okay, good. Got the right place then. Uh, the only change that we're that staff is showing um, is that change that we talked about with spot mobility and safety earlier in the meeting. And at that at uh, beyond that. Um, <clears throat> We're not showing any other changes to the percentage percentages for the uh, point totals. I think at the tab meeting, it was recommended that the technical committees review all the criteria to determine where additional points could come from to, uh, to add to safety. You already talked about that. Yeah. We've already made a decision on that. So I think we're good to go there on 2E. Anybody feel to the contrary? Okay, let's go. Let's okay, go. after this, the scoring measures, again, this was largely technical in nature. You you heard uh, the biggest changes here was equity and affordable housing, and uh, the rest of it will be shown in track changes as, as you see it and vote on it next month. Um, so, right. Any, anybody feel differently other than uh, what we uh, previously talked about and determined? Both the staff recommendation and uh, on the scoring measures and then on the modal funding ranges. Yeah, and I'll say, Mr. Chair, in the last two that we have here, um, these are if a change is to be made, even at the September meeting, if we run out of time today, that would be fine from staff's perspective because these are small changes that don't cascade. So if there's not enough time to kind of fully discuss the item today, um, next month is, is perfectly fine for us to still make a change before the public comment period. So it's up it's up to you if you want to dig into these or not today. I I really feel like we've asked uh, you know my own schedule notwithstanding uh, folks have been here for two and a half hours. Yeah. Um, 
Well, let's let's take this one and see if we're, where it goes. We can. Okay. Uh, uh, so the modal funding ranges were established orig originally back in 2014. And you can see there's both a range and a midpoint. And, and what TAB back in going into 2014 really tried to do was, was create flexibility in the process. And that's why you see a rather large range for both roadways, transit, and, and bike ped. That was meant to give applicants an indication of roughly the amount of money that they could expect in each of those modal funding areas. The projects would come in and be scored, and that would give TAB some flexibility on the, uh, in project selection to go up or down um, within those ranges. And back in uh, 2020, so the last cycle, uh, with a number of transit changes that took place, you did vote um, to change the modal funding ranges. And the percentages are maybe tough to uh, decipher, but essentially what it was was a $5 million shift um, into transit, um, four million from roadways, one million from bike ped, and that so that moved transit from 27% as the midpoint to the midpoint of 30%, and you can see how the ranges changed slightly there. We did end up in the range uh, last time, although not perfectly at the midpoint, which is fine um, in the last cycle. But part of this approval also would be to set aside that same amount of money, 2.5% for unique projects. Yeah. So but also, just a reminder that we had that shift in 2020 of five million to transit. That is that right? Yeah. That that shift uh, shift is uh, shown here on the table. Um, we have the percentages, but that that did amount to five million dollars. Right. And let's also talk a little bit about uh, what Member Geisler raised in the uh, in the exec committee, and that was uh, that for for new folks on the tab, the emphasis is really on the range, and the midpoint is just really a, a a guide. But I'll let you explain that in a little bit more detail. Yeah, you know, even previously, we never even showed the midpoint until last cycle. It was always just a range that was shown in the application, and um, really, and the options that we bring back to you in one year from now, when when we have the actual projects, will be those that fit into this range. So that gives staff some flexibility too to bring a variety of different options back to this group and see where you want to land on that but uh, the range is really the most important the midpoint is kind of gives you a, uh, sometimes we end up or usually end up right around that midpoint area so that's why we've shown that as well but um, I know member guys are said yeah the range is really really what uh, we're trying to give applicants the indication of it in the application okay anybody have any comment here uh, Mr. Chair, Mary, Mary Member Foster. Oh, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so if the regional solicitation is a place to put into action what we hear in the tip comments, I think that changing the modal ranges is a way to do that. So I would like to call for a poll on changing them by three percentage points. So lowering roadways to 43 to 62% and increasing transit to 28 to 38%. Okay, this is gonna require some in-depth conversation and I want a full tab for the meeting. I think this is, yeah. I should have been more sensitive and uh, foresightful, I guess, and hold this matter over. Um, Mr. Chair, I, I, I've, I gotta be, I've gotta be at City Hall at uh, 3.30. So, I, I mean, I do have to yeah, leave. Go. Okay. Member Stevens? Yeah, I just, Steve, if you could just tell, how did this work? you know with the change in the in for 2020 did we have projects come in under these and did did you feel that it there was any downside to bike pad or roadways or have we had experience to see the success of this yeah uh, uh mr chair and, and member uh last last time all of the options we brought to you were within these funding ranges where we ended up was we devi we ended up in these funding ranges, but we deviated slightly from the midpoint um, to achieve geographic balance, and so we ended up roughly uh, two million plus two million on the midpoint for roadways, negative seven million for transit, and plus five million for bike ped, um, as as we kind of allocated those last few projects, and so we were within the range. We didn't uh, hit the midpoint, but that wasn't necessarily. The, the end state either so okay so you feel you had good flexibility within these ranges for the projects yeah okay thank you we did, yeah. okay so steve can we hold over both the g and h and then uh, the h sip 
I, I think that's a, that's a good call. Minor changes to HSIP, so you'll see that as an action item next month. Yeah, okay, all right. Sorry, folks, I think we just gotta, yeah. Yeah. gotta go. Um, so uh, thank you so much for uh, your yeah. great attention here and your great participation. That really is quite a group. Um, so let's talk about G and H. We'll get dig into that next month, and then we'll make some decisions next month. And we're going to all uh, uh, give this re next regional solicitation some uh, some good guidance here and some good direction. So very thoughtful conversation. Thanks, everybody. We'll thank you. Turn. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Good job. Yes. Have you loaded? Thank today. you. Good afternoon.